35, Five Kings. Spoilers all books! Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm Lady Guinevere in Boston. And I'm Yoke Boy in England. And with this episode, we're happy to bring you the second instalment of our analysis on the War of the Five Kings. Yeah, this is part two of a three-part series. And in part one, we covered the backstory of the war, reviewed the five kings, the military commanders, and other major players, as well as explored the origins of the conflict. And we also offered a complete analysis of the first stage of the war, when hostilities between House Stark and House Lannister began in the Riverlands. Throughout, our goal has been to relate the events in chronological order as best as we can, to give you listeners a real sense of how things were unfolding in various locations in relation to each other. And with today's episode, we'll carry on with the action of the war, from the Riverlands to the Stormlands, the Westerlands, the North, and the Reach. And finally, we'll analyze the climactic battle of the war as Stannis Baratheon leads the attack on King's Landing. Yeah, a large part of this episode will actually be devoted to the Battle of Blackwater, its build-up and aftermath. We've never discussed Blackwater in an episode, so it's exciting for us, and you'll find we have plenty to say about it here. And we want to give a very special shout out to our friend, Jim McGeehan, aka Something Like a Lawyer from the Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog, who sat down to talk Blackwater with us during the research phase of this episode. And if you're interested in the history of warfare, check out Jim's podcast, to wage war. And before we get started, we just want to say thanks to all of you listeners who support us in so many ways. We truly appreciate all you do to keep Radio Westeros going strong. Yeah, we do, and many of you will know that we have a Patreon campaign. Patrons provide financial support for us while earning rewards that many of our listeners have enjoyed, such as behind-the-scenes updates, shout-outs, and early ad-free access to episodes. So we want to thank all of our patrons, including our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patrons, John Wargarian and Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Lord Commander Daenera Flint, Kelly, Rosa, Rory, Ashley, Laura, Sister Winter, and Harry Krishna. Each episode of Radio Westeros takes weeks of preparation and production to make. To find out how you can support us in that effort and gain these rewards, for as little as $3 an episode, visit us at patreon.com slash Radio Westeros to check out our campaign. And now it's time to continue on with part two of the War of the Five Kings. I want to see the Riverlands of Fire from the God's Eye to the Red Fork. So we'll pick up the action at the Crossroads Inn once again with Lord Tywin's council after receiving the messenger with news of Jamie's defeat and capture at Whispering Wood. There had been other messages as well, one from Varys with news of Renly's claim and another from Cersei commanding her father to, quote, ride for King's Landing at once to defend the Red Keep against King Renly and the Knight of the Flowers. Yeah, and clearly Tywin was not amused with Cersei's decision-making or her tone. He mentions that she hasn't told Joffrey about Renly for fear the young king will take the city watch, the only army available to him, and march against his uncle Renly. Which would leave the capital utterly defenceless against his other uncle, of whom Tywin says... I have felt from the beginning that Stannis was a greater danger than all the others combined. And Tywin tells Tyrion that he's to go to King's Landing as acting Hand of the King to rule in his name, going on to chronicle his daughter's and grandson's poor decision-making when Tyrion comments that Cersei might have a thing or two to say about that. Let her say what she likes, 
Her son needs to be taken in hand before he ruins us all. I blame those jackanapes on the council. Our friend Peter, the venerable Grand Maester, that cockless wonder Lord Varys. What sort of counsel are they giving Joffrey when he lurches from one folly to the next? If Cersei cannot curb the boy, you must. So Tywin's opinion of the situation in King's Landing is not left in much doubt. Cersei may be his child that was, quote, made for Motley, after all, Joffrey is out of control and the small council are all in danger of losing their heads, if he has anything to say about it. Tyrion, as a Lannister, can at least be trusted to act in his family's self-interest, though the hindrance of his sister's disapproval is fully expected. In fact, Tyrion departs with a deep suspicion that this gift may be poisoned, thinking to himself... A part of him was more pleased than he cared to admit. Another part was remembering the battle upriver and wondering if he was being sent to hold the left again. Yeah, this reference to the Battle of the Green Fork serves to remind us of the troubled relationship between Tyrion and his father. And we also get a fairly detailed summary of the state of affairs in Westeros in this council when Tywin examines a map with his brother Sir Kevin. Jamie has left us in a bad way. Roose Bolton and the remnants of his host are north of us. Our enemies hold the twins in Mount Caelan. Rob Stark sits to the west, so we cannot retreat to Lannisport and the Rock unless we choose to give battle. Jamie is taken, and his army, for all purposes, has ceased to exist. Thoros of Mir and Beric Dondarrion continue to plague our foraging parties. To our east we have the Arryns, Stannis Baratheon sits at Dragonstone, and in the south, Highgarden and Storm's End are calling their banners. And Kevin Lannister points out that at River Run, Rob Stark's army, joined now by the Tully and Riverlands forces, may now exceed Tywin's. As he sees it, there's a risk of being caught between Rob, Roos and Renly. Tywin reveals his intent to march to Harrenhal and quote, Finish our business with young Lord Stark before Renly Baratheon can march from Highgarden. Yeah, and the next part of Tywin's plan is revealed to be positively fiendish as he tells Sir Kevin, Unleash Sir Gregor and send him before us with his reavers. Send forth Vargo Hote and his free riders as well, and Sir Amory Lorch. Each is to have 300 horse. Tell them I want to see the Riverlands afire from the God's Eye to the Red Fork. And we'll learn from Catelyn's point of view that Tywin would have hoped Rob would march against him at Harrenhal in retaliation for this, placing his certainty in Rob's youth and inexperience. But Tywin once again reckoned without Rob's training, his innate leadership and the advice he was getting from his great uncle, Brynden Blackfish Tully, A seasoned and renowned warrior with great tactical ability who clearly saw through this strategy. And so with Tyrion on his way to King's Landing with his mountain clansmen and the sellsword brawn and Tywin preparing to march on Harrenhal, Sir Gregor Clegane and his cohort were unleashed on the Riverlands once again along with the sellsword Vargo Ho and his brave companions and Sir Amory Lorch, that beast in human skin who not only killed Princess Rhaenys Targaryen during the sack of King's Landing but had also allegedly been responsible for the death of the last Lord Tarbeck when he threw the three-year-old boy down a well during the Rain Tarbeck Rebellion. Yes, Sir Armory is one of the true monsters of the story, and he and Sir Gregor and the brave companions would crisscross the Riverlands, wreaking havoc, coming across the nascent Brotherhood Without Banners more than once, with each band being responsible for killing the BWB's leader, Beric Dondarrion, who of course was mysteriously revived on each occasion by the Red Priest, Thoros of Mir. And it's during this period of chaos that Arya Stark, on the run from King's Landing with Yorin of the Night's Watch since her father's execution, would run afoul of first Sir Amory, then Sir Gregor, and later the Brave Companions at Harrenhal. 
So Amory would come across their party near the God's Eye and launch an attack on them in an abandoned holdfast in which Yorin was killed. Arya and a few companions would escape, only to be caught some days later by the mountain's men. Yeah, and following a demoralizing period in a hut on the banks of the God's Eye, Arya and her fellow prisoners would be marched to Harrenhal, where Tywin and his army were encamped. Having been caught up in this net, Arya will become our eyes in the Riverlands for a time, as Catelyn and Tyrion will both move south, along with much of the action of the war. Stannis Baratheon, Lord of Dragonstone, and by the grace of God's rightful heir to the Iron Throne of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, was broad of shoulder and sinewy of limb, with a tightness to his face and flesh that spoke of leather cured in the sun until it was tough as steel. Hard was the word men used when they spoke of Stannis, and hard he was. So, as we've mentioned, Stannis had been biding his time at Dragonstone, most likely waiting for Davos to return from his mission to the Stormlands. When he did, it was with bad news. None of the Stormlords would support him, and many had already declared for Renly. In addition, word had arrived that Robb Stark had been crowned at Riverrun. Eddard Stark's son has been proclaimed king in the north, with all the power of Winterfell and Riverrun behind him. And Maester Cresson suggests to Stannis that he might gain Rob's support if he committed to help avenge Ned. Interestingly, the idea of an alliance with Stannis had already been floated in Rob's war council at Riverrun. While Rob averred that Stannis had a better claim than Renly, and of the two it seemed that he would support the elder brother over the younger, as his father had, he was still troubled by the implications of treason against Robert's lawful heirs, Joffrey and Tommen. Yeah, consider that at that point, Stannis's letters declaring his own claim and Cersei's treason had yet to make their way around the kingdom. Knowledge or even rumour of the truth of Joffrey's parentage then was still limited to King's Landing. Had Ned found a way to inform his family prior to his death, or if Stannis had taken less time to make his move, Rob may have known the truth sooner and declared for Stannis, as his father most certainly would have advised. And as it is, Rob's lords, in their ignorance, named him king, and as Stannis prepared to make his own claim public and point the finger of treason, incest, and bastardy at Cersei and her children, he had no use for an alliance with, quote, another false king. His vitriol at the suggestion that he should help avenge Ned Stark is quite revealing of the resentment towards his elder brother that had simmered below the surface for years. In short, Stannis's opinion was, Why should I avenge Eddard Stark? The man was nothing to me. Oh, Robert loved him, to be sure. Loved him as a brother. How often did I hear that? I was his brother, not Ned Stark. But you would never have known it by the way he treated me. Yeah, what followed was a catalogue of slights Stannis had suffered from Robert over the years. That this is a family that would have benefited from some family therapy to help negotiate these troubled waters is obvious from Cresson's point of view. Anyway, following Cresson's death, which is a topic for another episode, and the burning of the Seven by Melisandre, Stannis makes his move, declaring his claim by sending a message to all corners of the kingdom to 117 castles and holdfasts. All men know me for the trueborn son of Stefan Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End, by his lady wife Cassana of House Estamont. I declare upon the honour of my house that my brother Robert, our late king, left no trueborn issue of his body, 
the boy Joffrey, the boy Tommen, and the girl Marcella being abominations born of incest between Cersei Lannister and her brother Sir Jaime the Kingslayer. By right of birth and blood, I do this day lay claim to the Iron Throne of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. Let all true men declare their loyalty, done in the light of the Lord, under the sign and seal of Stannis of House Baratheon, the first of his name, King of the Andals, the Rhoynar, and the First Men, and Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. So, Stannis acknowledges to Davos that the principal men of the realm will support Renly or Rob or Joffrey as they will, and he knows few will believe his message, and so he sends Davos and two of his sons with chests full of additional letters and enough knights to read them aloud to common folk in ports and fishing villages and at septs and inns from White Harbor to the Arbor and even across the narrow sea to the free cities. As Stannis says, the world will know of my claim and of Cersei's infamy. And so the letters fly to Winterfell, Harrenhal, Hornhill, Stokeworth, Rosby, King's Landing and beyond. At King's Landing, Tyrion had arrived some weeks previously and taken up the role of acting hand, much to his sister's displeasure. He set about cleaning house, dispatching Janos Slint to the wall, and preparing a gift for Joffrey, a quote, little chain. When Stannis' letter arrived, he convinced Cersei not to validate it by denying its contents, and they concocted a scheme to counter its effects by spreading tales about Selyse Baratheon and her fool Patchface. Yeah, and it's also during this time that Tyrion begins to plan to get Tommen and Marcella out of the city. Clearly, he's planning for the defense of the city from the moment he arrives, and removing his younger nephew and niece is a part of that. Back at Harrenhal, Tywin is biding his time, while Roose Bolton marched down the King's Road and occupied the Ruby Ford. That Tywin was waiting for Rob to march on him will be evident when Arya hears a Lannister soldier at Harrenhal say, Bolton will never cross, not till the young wolf marches from River Run with his wild Northmen and all them wolves. And it's also at Harrenhal that Arya, now put to work in the ranks of the domestic servants, sees the captives from the Battle of the Green Fork, including Wyllis Manderley, Harry and Karstark, Lord Medgar Kerwin, Sir Donald Locke, and a quartet of Freys. And an interesting side note is that the phrase would be ransomed by their family, as we see in Arya's point of view. One morning, two other brothers arrived under a peace banner with a chest of gold, and ransomed them from the knights who'd captured them. The six phrase all left together. Here is a curious intersection between House Frey and House Lannister that we've never seen discussed, the only time we specifically see an interaction between the two houses on page prior to the Red Wedding. While it will be months before we see Tywin writing suspicious letters in Tyrion's point of view, we know there had to have been a seed for the Frey-Lannister alliance somewhere, and we wonder if this might be it. Well, this is obviously well before Rob would make his major mistake of judgment, but Lord Walder's well known for sitting on the fence, and we'll see shortly that there remains a certain nervous quality to the Frey commitment to the Stark cause. But whatever may have been going on in the background, one thing is clear to the Starks and Tullys at Riverrun. A new Lannister army is being raised in the Westerlands by Tywin's cousin, Stafford Lannister, and, quote, Tywin will wait patiently for Sir Stafford to march before he stirs from behind the walls of Harrenhal. But even as Tywin waits for Rob, Rob waits at Riverrun while Cleos Frey is sent to King's Landing under a peace banner with Rob's terms for Cersei and his river lords work to reclaim their lands that had been seized by Lannisters. 
Raven Tree Hall, Stonehenge and Darry are reclaimed while Carl Vance and Mark Piper continue their raiding, only now on the offensive as they raid Lord Tywin's foragers. But less than two weeks after Darry was reclaimed for its young lord, Sir Gregor sacked the castle and had the entire household put to the sword, including young Lyman, the last male Darry. Along with Sir Gregor, Sir Amory and the Brave Companions continue their depredation of the Riverlands, constantly seeking Lord Berwick and his brotherhood, who continue to be irritants to the Lannister forces with their raiding and helping small folk when and where they can. And around this time, back at Winterfell, Bran hosts a harvest feast and receives as many of the Stark bannermen who remain in the north to pay homage. It's then that he hears about Stannis' letters and the fact that Ramsay Snow is raising men at the Dreadfort, a troubling piece of information given the young man refuses to declare his intentions to the neighbours. It hardly seems plausible that Roos was unaware of this operation, which of course would have grave consequences in the north as Ramsay would take advantage of Rob's absence to advance the Bolton interests on several occasions. At the very least, Roos was hedging his bets at this early stage, while his absence still provided him plausible deniability with regards to Ramsay's actions. I am the Greyjoy, Lord Reaper of Pike, King of Salt and Rock, Son of the Sea Wind, and no man gives me a crown. I pay the iron price. I will take my crown as Uran Red Hand did 5,000 years ago. In the meantime, Theon Greyjoy arrived at his father's stronghold on Pike for the first time in ten years, having departed the Riverlands some weeks earlier. Over Cat's objections and Ned's advice, Rob had decided to send his foster brother on the mission to Balon, telling Cat about Lord Greyjoy, I will not grudge him a crown. If I'm king in the north, let him be king of the Iron Islands, if that's his desire. I'll give him a crown, gladly, so long as he helps us bring down the Lannisters. But Theon had other ideas about the crown Rob would offer. As he approached the islands of his birth, his thoughts were about his own advancement. This was Theon's hour, his plan, his glory, and in time, his crown. And when he came to deliver Rob's message, he would tell his father, There is nothing small about the letter I bear, and the offer he makes is one I suggested to him. Yeah, and we pointed out in the last episode that it seems very likely that Theon had all of this in mind at River Run in those moments when Cat was thinking how much she distrusted him. But when Theon arrived at Lordsport, he saw an obvious muster of ships in the harbour. A great number of longships, fifty or sixty at the least, stood out to sea or lay beached on the pebbled shore to the north. Had Lord Balon anticipated him and called the Greyjoy banners? His hand went inside his cloak again to the oilskin pouch. No one knew of this letter but Rob Stark. They were no fools to entrust their secrets to a bird. Still, Lord Balon was no fool either. He might well have guessed why his son was coming home at long last, and acted accordingly. But Balon Greyjoy is a stranger to Theon, who apparently recalls little of the ways of the Ironborn. It becomes clear to Theon very quickly during their reunion that things won't be going as he had expected or planned. In fact, events seem to move quickly beyond his control. His father rejects Rob's offer and tells Theon what the Ironborn course will be. Do you think I gather my ships to watch them rock at anchor? I mean to carve out a kingdom with fire and sword, but not from the west and not at the bidding of King Rob the Boy. Casterly Rock is too strong and Lord Tywin too cunning by half. 
Aye, we might take Lannisport, but we should never keep it. No, I hunger for a different plum. Not so juicy sweet, to be sure. Yet it hangs there, ripe and undefended. So Theon understands that Balon means to gain his revenge on Ned Stark at last by striking at the north. It seems the old man has outlived his two former adversaries out of sheer spite, and rather than accept an alliance with Rob, he's hatched a devious plan to do something that amounts to taking Rob in the rear by sneaking into the north from the sea and closing the crossing at Moat Caelan. Rob had played into Balon's hand by sending Theon as his emissary, although, to be fair, given Balon's attitude to Theon and the fact he had already called his banners, it's not entirely clear whether Theon continuing as hostage would have really restrained him. And now going back to King's Landing, Tyrion has been busy making plans for the defence of the city and shoring up his family's position. We see the tremendous depth of his abilities during this time when he's free to act with his father's blessing and Cersei is more or less at bay. Tyrion sends an offer to Dawn for a marriage alliance between Doran Martell's son, Tristane, and Cersei's daughter, Marcella. Prince Doran is also offered a seat on the small council and perhaps most importantly, Vengeance for his sister, Princess Elia. So, Tyrion takes advantage of the opportunity offered by this piece of diplomacy to lay a trap for the counselors his father commanded him to straighten out. He first allowed Varys to believe he would send Tommen to Dorne, at the same time as telling Littlefinger that he's offering Myrcella to the Arryns. In fact, his plan is the reverse, and the untrustworthy counselor he reveals with his trap is Pycelle, who runs to Cersei with the information that Tyrion was offering Myrcella to the Martells. And Tyrion explains his plan to Cersei when she comes to him. The Martells have every cause to hate us. Nonetheless, I expect them to agree. Prince Doran's grievance against House Alistair goes back only a generation, but the Dornishmen have warred against Storm's End and Highgarden for a thousand years, and Renly has taken Dorne's allegiance for granted. Marcella is nine, Tristane Martell eleven. I have proposed they wed when she reaches her fourteenth year. Until such time, she would be an honoured guest at Sunspear, under Prince Doran's protection. And as furious as Cersei is, she agrees that Marcella will be safer in Dorne, as at this point King's Landing is still bracing for the hammer blow from Renly's huge army to fall. We also learn that what is in fact a very large chain and a cache of wildfire originally commissioned by his sister are involved in Tyrion's planning in the capital, and we see the beginnings of a plan to rescue Jaime when Cleos Frey arrives with Rob's terms. Cleos Frey, the son of Tywin's sister, Jenna and Lord Walder's second son, Emon, had chosen to fight for the Lannisters in spite of most of his house declaring for Rob. Captured at Whispering Wood, Cleos was chosen to travel with 30 of Rob's men to King's Landing to deliver Rob's terms to the Lannisters. First, the Queen must release my sisters and provide them with transport by sea from King's Landing to White Harbour. It is to be understood that Sansa's betrothal to Joffrey Baratheon is at an end. When I receive word from my Castellan that my sisters have returned unharmed to Winterfell, I will release the Queen's cousins, the Squire William Lannister and your brother Tion Frey and give them safe escort to Casterly Rock or wheresoever she desires them delivered. Secondly, my Lord Father's bones will be returned to us, so he may rest beside his brother and sister in the crypts beneath Winterfell, as he would have wished. 
the remains of the men of his household guard who died in his service at King's Landing must also be returned. Third, my father's great sword ice will be delivered to my hand here at Riverrun. Fourth, the Queen will command her father, Lord Tywin, to release those knights and lords bannermen of mine that he took captive in the battle on the Green Fork of the Trident. Once he does so, I shall release my own captives taken in the Whispering Wood and the Battle of the Camps, save Jamie Lannister alone, who will remain my hostage for his father's good behaviour. Lastly, King Joffrey and the Queen Regent must renounce all claims to dominion over the North. Henceforth, we are no part of their realm, but a free, independent kingdom as of old. Our domain shall include all the Stark lands north of the Neck, and in addition, the lands watered by the River Trident and its vassal streams, bounded by the Golden Tooth to the west and the Mountains of the Moon in the east. So, after delivering those terms, Cleos informs his cousin Tyrion that Rob sits idle at River Run, perhaps afraid to meet Tywin in the field, while the River Lords depart to defend their own lands. As it happens, this will turn out to be inaccurate, since by the time Cleos would depart King's Landing, Rob had almost certainly moved into the West for a carefully planned offensive there that Cleos' mission may have been designed to cloak. Here once again we see a Lannister underestimating Rob's decision-making process. Here are Tyrion's thoughts after talking to his cousin and reading Rob's terms. It seemed to him that Rob Stark had given them a golden chance. Let the boy wait at River Run, dreaming of an easy peace. Tyrion would reply with terms of his own, giving the king in the north just enough of what he wanted to keep him hopeful. Let Sir Cleos wear out this bony fray rump riding to and fro with offers and counters. All the while, their cousin Sir Stafford would be training and arming the new host he'd raised at Casterly Rock. Once he was ready, he and Lord Tywin could smash the Tullys and the Starks between them. And again, it's clearly laid out what the Lannister plan to defeat Rob Stark was. The problem would be how obvious the plan was to Rob and his great uncle Brynden Tully. Nonetheless, Tyrion doubled down on his assessment when he discussed the terms with Cersei and noted that Regarding the apparent standoff between Tywin and Rob, there is sitting and there is sitting. Each one waits for the other to move, but the lion is still poised, his tail twitching, while the fawn is frozen by fear, bowels turn to jelly. No matter which way he bounds, the lion will have him, and he knows it. Yeah, Tyrion, you might be underestimating the fawn because he's more like a wolf, really. And anyway, Tyrion relayed his counterterms to Cleos that Rob must lay down his sword and bend the knee, release Jaime and place his army under Jaime's command to fight against Renly and Stannis and send hostages from each of his bannermen to King's Landing. Ned's bones would be returned, which cost the Lannisters absolutely nothing, but... Ice and Sansa and Arya would be returned only when Jaime was released and Rob had made his peace. Cleos Frey, knowing that Rob would never agree to these terms, was to be sent back to River Run to relay them with the escort Rob had sent with him and a new escort of the hundred Lannister men Tywin had sent to the city to be Cersei's guard. And it's Varys who discerns that Tyrion has concocted a plan to use those guards as a Trojan horse of sorts to get four men inside the walls of Riverrun. 
This would doubtless involve the four men your man Braun searched for so diligently in all the low places of King's Landing. A thief, a poisoner, a mummer, and a murderer. And Tyrion's reply, Put them in crimson cloaks and lion helms. They'll look no different from any other guardsmen. I searched for some time for a ruse that might get them into River Run before I thought to hide them in plain sight. They'll ride in by the main gate, flying Lannister banners and escorting Lord Eddard's bones. Four men alone would be watched vigilantly. Four among a hundred can lose themselves. So I must send the true guardsmen as well as the false, as you'll tell my sister. And of course, clever Tyrion made use of another opportunity to solve two problems with one move. The plan to rescue his brother also neatly hobbled his sister by divesting her of her private guard, or so he hoped. And Cleos's departure with Tyrion's counterterms coincided with the arrival of news that Stannis is besieging Storm's End and Doran Martell's answer to Tyrion's offer. And while it seems that, as Tyrion expected, the long-time enmity between Sunspear and Highgarden played its role, we've wondered if the knowledge that Stannis had committed himself against Renly, which was then spreading across the Seven Kingdoms, could have swayed Doran Martell into accepting Tyrion's offer. As George put it, Doran plays to win, whether at Syvas or the Game of Thrones. Likely, he did not see Renly as a winner. Yeah, as we said in the Renly episode, having to fight his own elder brother in order to press his claim may have hurt the appearance of Renly's cause. In any case, with the Martells pledged to their side, Tyrion perhaps grew overconfident in his message to Rob. Time would tell, of course, that Rob was not exactly sitting at River Run doing what was expected of him. And in the meantime, as we mentioned earlier, Catelyn had been sent on a diplomatic mission to Renly in the Reach. She arrived at Bitterbridge to find the self-proclaimed king presiding over a tourney with his massive army encamped around him. Renly received her with all courtesy, but later that evening they met for a private discussion. He began by telling her, On the night of Robert's death, I offered your husband a hundred swords and urged him to take Joffrey into his power. Had he listened, he would be regent today, and there would have been no need for me to claim the throne. While the news comes as no surprise to Catelyn, note the subtle accusation from Renly. It's almost as if he's saying this turn of events was Ned's fault. Renly then shows Catelyn the campfires of his army, telling her that he has near 80,000 men under his command at Bitterbridge, with another 10,000 at Highgarden under Mace Tyrell, and a garrison at Storm's End. He also tells her that, quote, Soon enough the Dornish men will join me with all their power, and warns her not to forget my brother Stannis, who holds Dragonstone and commands the Lords of the Narrow Sea, implying that he expects to have Stannis' support as well. So, it seems that Renly believes at this time that Dorne will be his, though, as we know, Tyrion Lannister was making his own bid in that direction. Renly also seems convinced that Stannis will fall into line and support him, though Catelyn pointedly remarks that Stannis is the elder and has the superior claim. This is dismissed, as is Robert's claim of 15 years previous. Renly, with his inferior claim, must rely on his superior army, and so he'll emphasize that which works in his favor, the right of conquest. And then the talk turns to Rob, and the serious business which has brought Catelyn to this place. Renly offers to confirm Rob in all his lands and titles, including even continuing to call himself King in the North in exchange for Rob's fealty, loyalty and service. When Kat asks what the alternatives are, Renly's reply is unequivocal. I mean to be king, my lady, and not of a broken kingdom. 
I cannot say it plainer than that. 300 years ago, a Stark King knelt to Aegon the Dragon when he saw he could not hope to prevail. That was wisdom. Your son must be wise as well. Once he joins me, this war is as good as done. And as we said, Cat had mentioned homage when the idea of treating with Renly first arose back at River Run. Whether she was actually prepared to make that offer and forge the alliance that Renly was suggesting is anyone's guess, though, since at that moment a messenger arrived with the news that Stannis was at the gates of Storm's End, calling himself King of Westeros. Tyrell swords will make me king. Rowan and Tarly and Caron will make me king. With axe and mace and warhammer, Tarth arrows and Penrose lances, Fossaway, Coy, Mullendor, Estamont, Selmy, Hightower, Oakheart, Crane, Caswell, Blackbar, Morrigan, Beesbury, Sherman, Dunn, Footley, even House Florence, your own wife's brothers and uncles, they will make me king. All of the chivalry of the South rides with me, and that is the least part of my power. My foot is coming behind a hundred thousand swords and spears and pikes. And so Renly went to Storm's End, splitting his forces as Rob had done at the Twins to rush across country with his cavalry. But in leaving behind his slower foot soldiers, he also abandoned his baggage and supply trains. Catelyn saw clearly the problem of Renly's position. How like his brother Robert he was. Only Robert had always had Eddard Stark to temper his boldness with caution. Ned would surely have prevailed upon Robert to bring up his whole force to encircle Stannis and besiege the besiegers. That choice Renly had denied himself in his headlong rush to come to grips with his brother. He had outdistanced his supply lines, left food and forage days behind with all his wagons and mules and oxen. He must come to battle soon, or starve. But, of course, first there would be a parley. It was Kat's hope to help forge peace between the two brothers. From her first words with Stannis, it was clear her chances were slim. But still she made the effort, telling the brothers, Let us hope there will be no battle. We three share a common foe who would destroy us all. But of course they rejected her, even as they rejected each other. But even though the brothers' reunion was not going as she'd hoped, she still attempted to divert Stannis from her son Rob's perceived transgression, though with little success. Here's a passage. Stannis frowned at her. You presume too much, Lady Stark. I am the rightful king, and your son no less a traitor than my brother here. His day will come as well. The naked threat fanned her fury. You are very free to name others traitor and usurper, my lord. Yet how are you any different? You say you alone are the rightful king. Yet it seems to me that Robert had two sons. By all the laws of the Seven Kingdoms, Prince Joffrey is his rightful heir, and Tommen after him. And we are all traitors, however good our reasons. At this point, Renly had to reveal that Catelyn had not seen Stannis's letter, nor did she know of the charge that Cersei's children were bastards. And really, it seems to us that it was extremely disingenuous of Renly to make light of the letter, when as we've mentioned, the Marjorie Robert plot is a strong indicator that he knew about the incest all along. But just as he had earlier chosen to overlook Robert's blood claim to the throne in favour of the claim by right of conquest, he chose here to dismiss Stannis's claim as unprovable, which it technically was in a world without paternity tests, where what mattered was the recognition and acceptance 
by the father of his wife's children. And this was all calculated to avoid giving Stannis any appearance of an edge and to cater to his own conviction that his bigger army would make him king. And so the parley disintegrated into insults and taunts in spite of Catelyn's best efforts. Her thought process, putting together the apparent trail of Lannister involvement in Jon Arryn's death with the former hand's knowledge, was interrupted when Stannis lost patience with his brother's insults once and for all. Drawing his sword, Lightbringer, he declared, I am not without mercy, nor do I wish to sully Lightbringer with a brother's blood. For the sake of the mother who bore us both, I will give you this night to rethink your folly, Renly. Strike your banners and come to me before dawn, and I will grant you Storm's End and your old seat on the council, and even name you my heir until a son is born to me. Otherwise, I shall destroy you. The parley broke up with a warning from Melisandre. Look to your sins, Lord Renly. Back at the Royal Pavilion, there was a debate about strategy. Lord Mathis Rowan offered caution. Your Grace, I see no need for battle here. The castle is strongly garrisoned and well provisioned. Sir Courtney Penrose is a seasoned commander, and the trebuchet has not been built that could breach the walls of Storm's End. Let Lord Stannis have his siege. He will find no joy in it, and whilst he sits cold and hungry and profitless, we will take King's Landing. But Renly's pride made him uncertain, and Lord Randall Tarley's opinion differed from Lord Rowan's, a classic dove versus hawk situation. I say that Stannis is a danger to you. Leave him unblooded and he will only grow stronger while your own power is diminished by battle. The Lannisters will not be beaten in a day. By the time you are done with them, Lord Stannis may be as strong as you, or stronger. Coming from a man of Tarly's military experience, this was rank foolishness. Renly had overextended his army, as Catelyn clearly saw, and Stannis's strength was not growing, nor was there a remote chance that his army, now numbering around 5,000, would increase twentyfold as he lay siege to Storm's End. Not only that, but in spite of Renly's superior numbers, there was a real risk that Stannis would prevail in the battle at hand. Yeah, following Renly's decision to meet Stannis in battle, in large part because he could not bear to have men say that he had feared to face his elder brother, his lord suggested that they sound the attack in the dark to avoid being blinded by the rising sun, Randall Tarley correctly perceived Stannis' strategy in choosing to meet his brother facing west at dawn, with the dawn to his back, which only emphasizes the hubris of Tarley's insistence that they engage in this battle at all costs. And given the innate caution of Lords Rowan and Estamont, who had command of the centre and reserve, and the relative inexperience of the men Renly had chosen to lead the rest of his army, including himself and Bryce Caron on the right and left, and Loras Tyrell in the van, it seems like Stannis's disciplined plan just might have borne fruit. In fact, it's made clear in the text that even Stannis didn't expect what happened next. Yeah, Melisandre, having seen a vision of Renly in his green armor attacking Stannis and defeating him outside the gates of King's Landing, took it upon herself to dispense with Renly once and for all in an effort to prevent that vision from coming true. That she failed utterly will be revealed weeks later. For now, it must have seemed a triumph to her. And while Stannis insists he mourns for his brother, his unease is apparent as he describes what happened that night to Davos later. And of course we see Renly's death from Catelyn's point of view, following which she flees the Stormlands, making for River Run with the innocent but suspect Brienne of Tarth in tow. Renly died ignominiously, slain by a shadow, and he left no heir of his body. 
As such, Stannis was his next of kin, and so the decampment of the Stormlords to Stannis's side was not seen as turning cloak, but rather a natural matter of inheritance. Yeah, and Bryce Karen would tell Courtney Penrose, No man here is a turncloak, sir. My fealty belongs to Storm's End, and King Stannis is its rightful lord and our true king. He is the last of House Baratheon, Robert's heir and Renly's. I remember that these men did not suspect Stannis was involved, but accused Brienne as Emon Kai had done with his dying breath. Significantly, though, as Sir Courtney would point out, the Tyrells and Reacher Lords did not rush to Stannis' side. Recall Lord Mace Tyrell's burning ambition was to see his daughter as queen? Clearly, this wouldn't be possible with Stannis, and Peter Baelish will have been well aware of this. As Mace hesitated at Highgarden, Tyrion Lannister sent Littlefinger on a secret mission of diplomacy to propose a new alliance with a new prize and thus capitalise on the Lord of Highgarden's ambition. His Grace won a great victory at Oxcross. Sir Stafford Lannister is dead, his host scattered. In the meantime, Rob Stark had been busy. Rather than waiting at River Run while Lannister forces regrouped themselves to his east and west as Tyrion hoped, or marching on Harrenhal as Tywin clearly anticipated he would, Rob marched his army west into Tywin's own homeland. Finding a secret passage around the crag with the help of his direwolf Greywind, he led his army straight to a village called Oxcross, three days' ride from Casterly Rock, where Sir Stafford Lannister was training his new army of raw recruits. And being so close to the rock, Sir Stafford hadn't felt the need to post sentries. A few days later, Tyrion would tell the tale to Sansa in King's Landing. The Northmen crept into my uncle's camp and cut his horse lines, and Lord Stark sent his wolf among them. Even war-trained destroyers went mad, knights were trampled to death in their pavilions, and the rabble woke in terror and fled, casting aside their weapons to run the faster. Sir Stafford was slain as he chased after a horse. Lord Rickard Carstark drove a lance through his chest. Sir Rupert Brax is also dead, along with Sir Lyman Vickery, Lord Craycall, and Lord Jass. Half a hundred more have been taken captive, including Jass' sons and my nephew Martin Lannister. It was a great victory for Rob, the second time he had destroyed a Lannister army in a matter of months. Following Oxcross, the west was virtually undefended, and Rob's army began scouring the area at will, with Mage Mormont raiding for cattle and the Great John seizing several gold mines. Rob himself took Ashmark, the seat of Tywin's cousins, the Marbrands. Tywin would have no choice but to march from Harrenhal to defend his lands. Yeah, Brendan Tully would explain the plan to lure Tywin west sometime later. We were all horsed. The Lannister host was mainly foot. We planned to run Lord Tywin a merry chase up and down the coast, then slip behind him to take up a strong defensive position athwart the gold road at a place my scouts had found where the ground would have been greatly in our favour. If he had come at us there, he would have paid a grievous price. But if he did not attack he would have been trapped in the west, a thousand leagues from where he needed to be. All the while, we would have lived off his land instead of him living off ours. Okay, so more on that shortly. And now, around this same time in the north, Ramsay Snow had made his move on the Hornwood, forcibly marrying the widowed Lady Donella Hornwood and claiming her estates. 
Roderick Cassell departed Winterfell to enforce the Lord's peace upon the bastard of the Dreadfort, and within a matter of weeks would return with Ramsay Snow, who had cleverly disguised himself as his own serving man. Having killed the real Reek wearing Ramsay's clothing, Sir Roderick casts Ramsay, now called Reek, into the Winterfell dungeons, where he is forgotten for a time. Meanwhile, in King's Landing, things had grown very tense. With news of a fresh Lannister defeat and mounting hunger and privation in the city, things were ripe for some civil unrest. On the day Marcella was sent to dawn, violence broke out on an epic scale. Shouting for bread and howling for blood, the mob attacked the royal party, who barely made it back to the Red Keep alive. As it was, they were hardly unscathed, with Sir Aaron Santagar, Sir Preston Greenfield, and the High Septon all killed, Lollis Stokeworth raped, and Tyrek Lannister disappearing. Sansa Stark was briefly lost as well, though she was saved and returned by the Hound. So, with things looking very grim in the capital, the Ironborn raiding of the North had begun. Victarion Greyjoy was sent to take Moat Caelan from the west, effectively closing the north to reinforcements from the Riverlands, and Asha and Theon began raiding the shores. Their targets were Sea Dragon Point and the Stony Shore, but Asha marched inland with a force of a thousand men and seized Deepwood Mott. Theon had a much grander plan. Having dispensed with Benfred Tallhart, who had been sent to protect the Stony Shore, Theon sent his captain, Dagmar Clefjaw, with a small force to attack Torrance Square. Then he waited for word to reach Winterfell. And as expected, Roderick Cassell marched out again to deal with this new threat, leaving Winterfell exposed to Theon's knowledge of the place and a small force of 30 men. Following his subjugation of the castle and his people, Theon discovered a forgotten prisoner in the castle dungeons. Two weeks later, at the suggestion of this man, he would take a step that would change everything in the north and haunt Theon forever. And it's also probably around this time that Lord Balon sent a message to King's Landing inviting Joffrey to send an envoy to the Iron Islands to, quote, fix the borders between their realms and discuss a possible alliance. Of interest is the fact that had Balon known the full thrust of Rob's plan in the West, which had the potential to neutralize House Lannister, as Theon clearly did, he may not have been so quick to make this offer, or even to make the moves he did against the North. Yeah, considering that at this time, much still hung in the balance for the Lannisters, who were now in real danger of being defeated on two fronts, it seems to us that a clever tactician in full possession of the facts might have held back to see which way the winds would blow. As it was, by acting quickly to offer alliance with House Lannister, things could have gone very differently for the Greyjoys indeed. But, though it might seem to the reader that Balon is backing the wrong horse for the moment, his spiteful gambit would end up paying dividends later. Anyway, speaking of alliances and twists of fate, in the meantime, and signifying a change in allegiance for the Reach, Lord Randall Tarley had returned to Bitterbridge and seized Renly's stores, putting a great many of his soldiers to the swords, especially Florence, whose lord had gone over to Stannis. And it's quite interesting to note that Lord Alistair Florent was Randall Tarley's own good father, with Tarly's wife, Melissa, being the eldest of Lord Alistair's two daughters. It's entirely possible that Lord Randall may have hoped to position himself to be granted Brightwater Keep, the seat of the wealthy Florence, by choosing the opposing side to his wife's family. Well, it's also possible that he was simply steadfastly loyal to his liege lord, Mace Tyrell. And ultimately, Brightwater would be bestowed elsewhere, and Alistair's only son and heir, Alakine Florent, would seek refuge with his other sister, the wife of Lord Leighton Hightower. 
In the meantime, Stannis had sent one of his wife Selyse's two brothers, Sir Aaron Florent, along with Sir Parman Crane, formerly Parman the Purple, of Renly's Rainbow Guard, to take Renly's foot under his command. Nearly 60,000 men who had been cooling their heels at Bitterbridge. Sir Aaron and Sir Parman would instead be taken prisoner by Loras Tyrell and remain at Highgarden for the balance of the war. And speaking of Highgarden, Littlefinger had travelled there via Bitterbridge to forge the new alliance between the Reach and the Crown. That the alliance would happen is made pretty clear by the quick action of Randall Tarley to secure the spoils at Bitterbridge. What's less clear is whether Baelish had any impact on Tarly's actions, or whether the Reacher Lords had decided to seek the Lannister Alliance independently. But that there would ultimately be an additional twist to the proceedings with the Tarleys is even less obvious at this point, although by this time the reader should probably be deeply suspicious of any deal Lord Baelish is involved in. Anyway, back at Storm's End, once again Melisandre's intervention led to an unnatural death when Sir Courtney Penrose had been under siege there and sent letters pleading for help and offering alliance to whichever king would break that siege, fell from the castle wall. It seems Stannis' insistence on taking custody of his brother Robert's natural son, Edric Storm, had raised alarm bells with Sir Courtney, and he was willing to die rather than hand the boy over. And die he did as Melisandre's second shadow baby worked its dark magic, and Storm's End and Edric Storm fell to Stannis, who was now free to march on King's Landing. And speaking of marching, with Lord Tywin marching from Harrenhal, Edmure Tully decided that he had a plan of his own. Commanding Lord Helmand Tallhart and his men to march from the twins, leaving Lord Walder to his own devices, and join up with Roose Bolton at the Ruby Ford, and from there to march on Harrenhal, Edmure made his own preparations to meet Tywin in battle on the banks of the Red Fork. Harrenhal had been left under the command of Sir Armory Lorch and 100 Lannister men, supplemented by Vargo Hoat and his brave companions. Vargo set out to allegedly give battle to Roose Bolton at the ford and returned with a number of northern prisoners. While Arya, who is our POV inside the castle, plotted to free the men, it soon became apparent that they were actually another Trojan horse of sorts, part of a ruse devised by Roose and Vargo, who had turned his cloak and negotiated a deal with Lord Bolton. That's right. Apparently, Bolton offered Vargo Hoat Harrenhal in exchange for the brave companions turning their cloaks. And so Harrenhal fell to the Northmen, with a little help from a young northern girl, and Amory Lorch met his grisly end in the bear pit. And it's probably a matter of some irony that four of the northern prisoners at Harrenhal, including Harry and Karstark, had been offered by Tyrion via Sir Cleos Frey in exchange for the squires Willem Lannister and Tyon Frey, who were being held at River Run. But the transfer of Harrenhal from Lannister hands to Roose Bolton's made that exchange unnecessary and thereby removed what would surely have been a safeguard for the two young squires' lives, with particularly tragic consequences. Consider this. Had Roos not contrived to take Harrenhal and free his fellow Northmen in the process, the exchange may well have taken place, or at least a living son in captivity may have stayed Lord Rickard Karstark's hand when it came to matters of vengeance months later. This is one of many small moments where George shows a careful reader how tiny stones tossed into the plot can cause huge ripples later on. Yeah, and that's not a detail we've seen discussed before because it's so easy to miss, but we think it really illustrates the genius of the level of detail that goes into George's planning. And in the meantime, 
Not much changed for Arya at Harrenhal, who continued in her disguise as a servant girl, seeking the right opening to reveal herself to a trustworthy person. And it's probably quite telling and fortunate that she didn't feel Lord Bolton was that person. At any rate, with Roos now ensconced at Harrenhal, we can return to Riverrun. Once Harrenhal falls, Lord Tywin will have no safe retreat. My own levies will defend the fords of Red Fork against his crossing. If he attacks across the river, he'll end up as Rhaegar did when he tried to cross the Trident. If he holds back, he'll be caught between Riverrun and Harrenhal, and when Rob returns from the west, we can finish him for good and all. With Rob winning in the west and chaos to the south and east, Edmure Tully concocted a plan to bring Tywin Lannister one step closer to defeat. Edmure thought to pin Tywin between Harrenhal and Riverrun, and then await Rob's return from the west to finish the now outnumbered and encircled army of the Lannisters. So with his army of nearly 11,000 strung out along the possible crossings of the Red Fork, they waited for Tywin Lannister. And in retrospect, this decision would be comparable to Jamie's actions in King's Landing following Catelyn's seizure of Tyrion. In that case, Tywin had a plan to lure Ned into the Riverlands, which was foiled by Jamie's impulsive ambush in King's Landing, in which Ned was injured and rendered unable to lead the force that was inevitably sent out to curb Sir Gregor. In this case, Rob had a plan to lure Tywin into the West, and it was Edmure's counterplan that foiled it. Now, this is an issue that's hotly debated in the fandom. Edmure was commanded by Rob to hold Riverrun. His plan and heroics at the Fords certainly exceeded those orders. But as the Lord Paramount of the region, and one known to have a penchant for heroics and defending his people... It might have been wise for Rob and Sir Brendan to let Edmure in on their plan, for they had a plan of their own, which most emphatically did not involve Edmure throwing Tywin back at the Red Fork. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. The defenders used the higher west banks of the Red Fork to place archers and siege engines at numerous crossings north and south of Riverrun. Edmure remained in the reserve with his mounted knights. After days of testing, a number of heavy attacks were mounted, including one under Sir Gregor Clegane at the Stone Mill. Clegane's forces gained the West Bank with heavy losses, but were thrown back by Edmure's reserve. Other attempts also failed, and Lord Tywin finally retreated to the southeast with the survivors. What Edmure couldn't have known was that in holding Lord Tywin in the Riverlands those extra days, he not only allowed time for messages to reach Tywin from his children about Stannis' attack of King's Landing and from the Tarly Tyrell forces at Bitterbridge, but he also destroyed the carefully laid plan to capture Tywin in his own territory and cut off his retreat to the east, which would have almost certainly secured a victory for Stannis at the capital. It turns out that Tywin's march to the southeast was not a retreat after all, but a rush to join up with Lords Rowan and Tully at the headwaters of the Blackwater Rush in an effort to relieve the capital. As we'll see, it was a situation where moments mattered, and Edmure's impact on the eventual outcome in King's Landing probably can't be overstated. As it was, Rob, soon to be ensconced at the crag, would be left to return to Riverrun and mete out his displeasure to his victorious uncle in private, while in public he would have to reveal another tactical error that would have even more far-reaching impact on his war effort. And to set up the discussion of that error... Let's return briefly to the North and Theon's act that we alluded to earlier. 
Around the same time that Edmure was engaging Tywin at the Red Fork, Theon was getting desperate to subdue the recalcitrant members of the Winterfell household, whose rebellions had only increased when Bran and Rickon vanished in the night with Hodor, the wildling Asha, the Reeds, their direwolves, and four swords stolen from the Winterfell tombs. After a fruitless search, it was the prisoner Reek, in reality Ramsay Bolton, who suggested killing the Miller's boys, ironic in that he himself had grown up at a mill and presenting them as the missing Starks. After dressing the two small corpses in Bran and Rickon's clothing, so-called Reek had, quote, flayed the skin from their faces and dipped their heads in tar. It says that Theon, quote, took no joy from those heads, no more than he had in displaying the headless bodies of the children before the castle. But he had needed the heads for the wall to send a potent message to the inhabitants of the castle about their defiance. Refusing to allow Maester Lewin to bury the bodies in the Winterfell crypts, not out of cruelty as it seemed, but likely because they weren't really Starks, he had burned them himself. And as a sign of Theon's conflict, it says, Afterward, he had knelt amongst the bones and ashes to retrieve a slag of melted silver and cracked jet, all that remained of the wolf's head brooch that had once been Bran's. He had it still. Okay, so that's Theon's deception at Winterfell, and that news would actually take some time to travel. So now let's turn our attention back to King's Landing and the build-up to the largest, most significant battle of the war. But first, here are some words from those lovely folk at the Pyromancers Guild. Are you looking for a fireworks display for a special occasion? Perhaps you want to burn down parts of your home that you don't like? Then come speak with the Pyromancers Guild, where we all dream in green. Wildfire is but one of the dread secrets of our ancient order. The substance flows through our veins and lives in the heart of every pyromancer. Once it takes fire, the substance burns fiercely until it is no more. It seeps into cloth, wood, leather, even steel. So they take fire as well. Piss on wildfire and your cock burns off. So, if you want to attack your enemies with more gusto than flinging a few naked blokes with antlers attached to their heads, come talk to me, Elaine, about our secret caches of green gold. The Pyromancer's Guild will burn off more than your cock. In advance of Stannis' arrival, Tyrion had sent out his mountain clans across the river into the Kingswood to burn the countryside, kill Stannis' scouts, and generally harass his flanks. He also burned all the structures on the north bank of the Blackwater Rush between the river and the city walls. Docks, warehouses, brothels, and hovels alike, to prevent Stannis using the structures for cover, or worse yet, to gain a leg up on his inevitable assault on the walls. Yeah, in preparation for the battle to come, Tyrion not only cleared out the riverfront, but the river itself, closing it to all traffic except for the royal war galleys, which now patrolled the stretch of river closest to King's Landing, exchanging arrows with Stannis' van on the south bank. The van, led by Sir Guyard Morrigan, formerly Guyard the Green of Renly's Rainbow Guard, numbered 5,000 men, nearly equal to the size of the city watch within the walls. The watch was now comprised mostly of unseasoned guardsmen, of whom Tyrion thinks only about a quarter could be relied upon. Tyrion also had a core group of around 300 knights and 800 sellswords, whose services had been hired by Bronn. So, fewer than 7,000 men would defend the city, many of whom would be worthless in a siege, leading Tyrion to recall his father's saying, one man on a wall was worth ten beneath it, 
with some amount of hope. In the meantime, Tyrion's plan to defend the city with wildfire was bearing some very dangerous fruit. Mere days before Stannis' van arrived in the Kingswood, Helline the Pyromancer reported to Tyrion that his order had been able to produce the astonishing total of 13,000 jars of wildfire. Telling the disbelieving Tyrion that the Pyromancer's spells seemed to be working better than they had since, quote, magic had begun to go out of the world the day the last dragon died, Helline wonders if there are any dragons about. Any dragons? Of course not. A nice little tidbit directed at the readers there who know much more than Tyrion about whether dragons have truly returned to the world, as Helene seems to imply. At any rate, we also learn that Cersei had sent Tommen as Joffrey's heir from the city with Lord Giles Rosby, but Tyrion seized control of him, placing him in the hands of Jacelyn Bywater, who saw the boy safely installed at Rosby with a contingency plan in case of Stannis' victory, before returning to King's Landing to resume his command of the City Watch. Okay, so as we've mentioned, Tyrion had sent his mountain clansmen into the Kingswood to attack Stannis' vanguard and baggage trains and kill his scouts, effectively blinding him in his approach to the city. This was an excellent strategic use of the mountain men, whose continued presence in the city might be a liability in the event of a siege. Brave and fierce they may be, they were not soldiers and were utterly lacking in the discipline required in battle. Yeah, the last thing Tyrion needed was any further chaos inside the city. In spite of the good strategy evident in his preparations, there were those within the city who plotted against him. Mere days before Stannis' vanguard had appeared out of the south, a group of wealthy tradesmen, including the master armourer Solorian, had been discovered in treason by Varys. These men, loyal to Stannis and calling themselves Antler Men, had armed several hundred followers and planned to take the old gate and admit Stannis to the city once battle was joined. They were now held in captivity and would play a visible, if relatively minor, role in the battle to come. And now let's check in with Stannis' movements and strategy. We last saw him at Storm's End besieging Sir Courtney Penrose, who had remained recalcitrant in the wake of Renly's death. When Penrose fell to his death, Stannis had lost no time in sending his bastard nephew Edric Storm back to Dragonstone with Melisandre, especially after Bryce Caron reminded him, Your Grace, if the sorceress is with us afterward, men will say it was her victory, not yours. They will say you owe your crown to her spells. Yeah, and taking his legacy from Renly, an army now numbering nearly 20,000 mounted knights, light horse and free riders, Stannis struck up the King's Road, while his navy of 200 ships, nearly four times the size of Joffrey's, made its way up the coast. And this is where the timing of the attack truly begins to make the outcome hang in the balance. Yeah, because with both army and navy outnumbering the Lannister defences by a huge margin, a coordinated attack by Stannis stood a very strong chance of success. As it was, the navy encountered delays due to bad weather in Shipbreaker Bay and the Straits of Tarth, and Stannis would outpace his navy by more than a week, arriving in the Kingswood to face Tyrion's marauders and cool his heels waiting for his navy, which carried his siege engines and his hopes of victory to bring up the rear. Keep an eye on the margin of time here, as it will play a critical role in the outcome. Another thing to be considered is the leadership of Stannis' navy. Following Renly's death, most of the Florence, family to Stannis' wife Selyse, had come over to Stannis' cause. Command of the navy was given to Sir Imri Florent, Stannis' own brother-in-law. Sir Imri lacks the experience of his king, and with a combination of haste brought on by the delays the navy encountered and hubris brought on by their numerical advantage, he concocted a plan that ignored Davos Seaworth's 
more cautious recommendation to send scout ships ahead and take stock of the situation. It says, He would organise a fleet into ten lines of battle, each of twenty ships. The first two lines would sweep up the river to engage and destroy Joffrey's little fleet, or the boy's toys, as Sir Imri dubbed them, to the mirth of his lordly captains. Those that followed would land companies of archers and spearmen beneath the city walls, and only then join the fight on the river. The smaller, slower ships to the rear would ferry over the main part of Stannis' host from the south bank, protected by Salador San and his Lysini, who would stand out in the bay in case the Lannisters had other ships hidden up along the coast, poised to sweep down on their rear. And it must have seemed a perfect plan, designed to smash the smaller royal fleet while simultaneously enabling the besieging army to attack the walls at multiple points, which would by that time be under attack by the siege engines that were carried by the very ships of the attacking navy. But the defenders, of course, had plans of their own. From the three mighty trebuchets inside the river gate, dubbed the whores by the city watch, to the usual array of scorpions and spitfires on the walls, and a couple of other, more subtle devices. Yet Tyrion had paired his scouring of the riverbank with the submersion of a number of wrecks between the quays which remained, designed to prevent enemy ships from landing troops under the city walls. Using these block ships, as they're called, is a relatively common naval defence seen in real-life examples such as the British battleship HMS Hood, sunk to protect Portland Harbour in the UK from German U-boats during World War I, and the 11th century Skuldelev ships in Roskilde, Denmark. Okay, and speaking of naval defences, Tyrion's boom chain lay submerged at the mouth of the rush, suspended between towers on north and south banks, apparently waiting to be deployed. The chain would be immediately perceived by Davos, whose only surprise at its existence seemed to be that it wasn't being used defensively. Once the attackers had entered the river, Davos would see that the intent was to trap them from retreat, though he would assume it would be a strategy aimed at cutting off reinforcements or dividing their forces. And Davos wasn't alone in disregarding the significance of the boom chain. As a relatively common defensive feature in such situations, Stannis also failed to place a huge priority on disabling it. Upon his arrival on the south bank of the Blackwater Rush, he spent his time preparing his troops for battle, building rafts and arrows, and pointedly ignoring the South Tower, more than likely in an effort to avoid the inevitable casualties such an attack would bring. But in hindsight, a critical error that would be one of several things that could be singled out as decisive to the outcome of the day. Gentle Mother, font of mercy, save our sons from war, we pray. Stay the swords and stay the arrows, let them know a better day. Gentle Mother, strength of women, help our daughters through this fray. Soothe the wrath and tame the fury, teach us all a kinder way. And so the day of the battle dawned. With Stannis' troops drawn up in the Kingswood, ablaze with fires lit by both Stannis and Tyrion's clansmen, and his navy bearing down upon the city from out in Blackwater Bay. Within the walls, the defenders manned their stations and prepared their counter siege measures. The residents of the city, not engaged in defence, gathered to pray in the great sept of Baylor, and the stage was set for the most violent day in A Song of Ice and Fire. While Tyrion commanded at the River Gate, or Mud Gate as the Kingslanders called it, King Joffrey would be allowed to oversee the trebuchets known as the Three Whores stationed just inside the gate. 
Joffrey would be guarded by Meryn Trant and Osmond Kettleblack, while Mandamore, Balon Swan, and Sander Clegane would be given commands of their own, tasked with leading sorties from the gate. Lancel Lannister and Jaislyn Bywater would also be placed in positions of command. Jaime, of course, remained in captivity at River Run, and Aris Oakheart was often torn as Princess Marcella's sworn sword. Inside Magor's holdfast, in the heart of the Red Keep, Cersei would gather all the highborn ladies of the court to feast in the Queen's ballroom, guarded by her own red cloaks, captained by Sir Osfrid Kettleblack and the royal headsman Sir Illyn Payne. When the wealthy tradespeople of the city would request refuge after rioting broke out in the city, she would refuse. While Lord Bywater's gold cloaks were able to suppress the violence in the city for the time being, as the day wore on, chaos would continue. And it's from Davos' point of view that we get the best view of the sequence of events as the navy enters visual range of the city late in the day. Stationed in the second line of battle, quote, well out on the dangerous starboard wing, along with his sons, Davos was well positioned to observe Imri Florent's battle plan and critique it, and also had a good view of what was happening with both their own land forces and the enemy's defense. He sees the implementation of the naval plan. Stannis's flagship, Fury herself, centered the first line of battle, flanked by the Lord Stefan and the Stag of the Sea, each with two hundred oars. On the port and starboard wing were the hundreds. Behind Davos and his sons came another line of hundreds, commanded by knights and lordly captains, and then the smaller, slower, mirish contingent, none dipping more than eighty oars. Farther back would come the sailed ships, carracks and lumbering great cogs, and last of all, in the rear guard, Salador San and his proud Valyrian, a towering three hundred, paced by the rest of his galleys with their distinctive striped hulls. And Davos is unrelentingly critical of Imri Florence's leadership, thinking how he would have done things differently, been more cautious and far less arrogant over their perceived numerical advantage. Even knowing that Stannis would have reached the rush days ahead of them due to the delays the navy encountered en route, Davos still found himself wishing the imp's boom chain had been raised, thinking... If the river was closed to them, Sir Imri would have no choice but to pause and take stock. And Sir Imri is not the only player in Stannis' navy that Davos finds fault with. He repeatedly notices the deficiencies of Swordfish, a ship that, quote, dipped 200 oars and mounted the largest ram in the fleet, and we're warned of his grave doubts about her captain. Swordfish would play a key and tragic role in the outcome of the day, and so our focus on that ship is no accident, and Davos's concern about that specific ship also serves as a symbol of the larger leadership issue with Stannis' naval force. Yeah, while Stannis was known to be a formidable admiral himself, he is renowned for his caution and careful strategy leading from the rear rather than rushing headlong into battle, as we see his brother Renly do, in clear imitation of Robert Baratheon's own battle zeal. We cannot think that Stannis, even as impatient as he may have been with the Navy's delays, would have approved of the overall strategy of Sir Imri. Since we later see Stannis come to rely on Davos's judgment, we think he would have done so in this case as well, had he been present. Unfortunately, Stannis had to bind his wife's family to him in a significant way, and giving them important and prominent roles in his leadership team was the best way to do so. And so Imri's strategy played out with the Baratheon navy sweeping into the Blackwater Rush as the much smaller opposing royal fleet backed water ahead of them. Davos could clearly see the strategy at play, and his unease becomes palpable. They mean to draw us in. They want us jammed close, constricted, no way to sweep around their flanks. And with that boom behind us. And as the fleet enters the river, the counter-siege engines in the city begin doing their job of flinging fire in the form of burning pitch into the attacking ships. As the second line came within range, firepots, 
arrows and scorpion bolts were falling like rain. Davos sees Stannis' vanguard forming up ranks on the south bank, ready to take the crossing that would be offered to them by the arriving navy, while the three ships, Piety, Prayer and Devotion, landed the first of Stannis' men on the north bank. Archers meant to provide cover to the troops, who would bring up the ram to the gate. And Davos sees Sander Clegane lead the first of the sorties made by the defenders as he leads a group of mounted men among the archers and men-at-arms who were debarking from the three ships, quote, like wolves among chickens, driving them back toward the ships and into the river before most could notch an arrow. Clegane would ride his horse right onto the deck of prayer, raining death from his sword as he went. Yeah, noting the destruction of the riverbank and the sunken wrecks submerged along the quays, Davos thinks, we shall have no landing there. And while Davos is unable to see the beginning of the naval engagement, he hears the great crashes as the opposing galleys come together and the noise of Fury's catapult. He observes both their own and enemy ships taking severe or catastrophic loss, and sees the three whores begin to send their own welcome of a rain of stones as large as a man's head into the battle below. It says, All across the river the first line was engaged. Grappling hooks were flung out, iron rams crashed through wooden hulls, borders swarmed, flights of arrows whispered through each other in the drifting smoke. And men died. And so the chaos of the battle begins, for now to be confined to the titanic struggle between the two fleets. Stannis' fleet had swept into the river like the Persians at the Straits of Salamis in the Greco-Persian War, their superior numbers becoming a hindrance as they struggled to maneuver and communicate. The irony of this comparison can't be understated, since there's also a comparison to be made between Salamis and Stannis' victory at Fair Isle in the Greyjoy Rebellion, where Stannis employed the Persian strategy of superior numbers and used the geography of the Straits to trap the defenders to great success. In this case, the outcome would mirror real-life history much more closely, as the force with the superior numbers would quickly find itself outmaneuvered. And for now, the principal land commanders would be reduced to the role of spectators as the naval battle played out on the river. For those inside the city and on the south bank, the battle was a cacophony to the senses, a combination of sights, sounds and smells that could only hint at the experience of those engaged upon the river. For the men aboard the ships, things were about to become a living nightmare. Away off, she could hear the sounds of battle. The singing almost drowned them out, but the sounds were there if you had ears to hear, the deep moan of war horns, the creak and thud of catapults flinging stones, the splashes and splinterings, the crackle of burning pitch and thrum of scorpions loosing their yard-long iron-headed shafts. And beneath it all, the cries of dying men. Continuing on from Davos's POV, we see the reality of ships bound together in a mortal struggle, the confusion of men dying and drowning and the first small pots of wildfire flung into the chaos. As devastating as wildfire could be, Davos reflects that Sir Imri had warned them to expect a taste of the alchemist's vile substance. Fortunately, there were few true pyromancers left. They will soon run out, Sir Imri had assured them. Okay, and Davos also notes the absence of three of the key vessels of the royal fleet, ships that should form the core of the city's defense. He's tasting a trap, but as the whores begin to fling boulders into the fray, he has little time to do anything except backwater away from the wildfire-engulfed Queen Alisanne. 
He glimpses a strange sight coming from upriver, quote, a swarm of small boats bearing down river, a confusion of ferries and wherries, barges, skiffs, rowboats, and hulks that looked too rotten to float. He thinks, quote, it stank of desperation. Such driftwood could not turn the tide of a fight, only get in the way. And then he is distracted as he engages first with Queen Circe's golden pleasure barge, an alien sight in the midst of this battle, and then with the white heart, which his crew boards and defeats in a short but bloody struggle. As Davos took a breath in the moment of victory, he observes the action around him. Here's the passage. For those few instants, Black Betha and Whiteheart were the calm eye in the midst of the storm. Queen Alisan and Lady of Silk, still locked together, were a raging green inferno, drifting down river and dragging pieces of Lady's shame. One of the Murrish galleys had slammed into them and was now afire as well. Cat was taking on men from the fast-sinking Courageous. The captain of Dragon's Bane had driven her between two keys, ripping out her bottom. Her crew poured ashore with the archers and men-at-arms to join the assault on the walls. Red Raven, rammed, was slowly listing. Stag of the Sea was fighting fires and borders both but the fiery heart had been raised over Joffrey's loyal man. Fury, her proud bow smashed in by a boulder, was engaged with God's grace. He saw Lord Valerian's pride of driftmark crash between two Lannister river runners, overturning one and lighting the other up with fire arrows. On the south bank, Knights were leading their mounts aboard the cogs, and some of the smaller galleys were already making their way across, laden with men-at-arms. They had to thread cautiously between sinking ships and patches of drifting wildfire. The whole of King Stannis' fleet was in the river now, save for Salador San's Lysini. Soon enough, they would control the Blackwater. Sir Imri will have his victory, Davos thought, and Stannis will bring his host across. But gods be good, the cost of this. So Davos sees Stannis' army beginning to cross the river and thinks the navy will soon have its victory in spite of the cost. But at that moment, his son Mathos returns his attention to Swordfish, the poorly captained vessel had failed to lower sails when the order came to do so and was now moving up river under oar with her sails and rigging aflame from burning pitch. Davos sees her swing her iron ram at the tempting target of the mass of rotten hulks he had observed earlier. And what he saw next caused his heart to, quote, stop beating. It says, Slow green blood was leaking out between the boards. So what happened next must have appeared in horrifying slow motion to Davos as he bellowed the order to back away to get as far from Swordfish and the Raft of Hulks as he could. It says, With a grinding, splintering, tearing crash, Swordfish split the rotted hulk asunder. She burst like an overripe fruit, but no fruit had ever screamed that shattering wooden scream. From inside her, Davos saw green gushing from a thousand broken jars, poison from the entrails of a dying beast, glistening, shining, spreading across the surface of the river. But it was too late. The flame from Swordfish's burning rigging ignited what was essentially the equivalent of a massive floating incendiary warhead. And the description from Davos's point of view is horrific. He describes a sharp woof and a moment later a massive explosion as the sound and shock waves reached him. His ship vanished in the blink of an eye and he found himself submerged. Struggling to the surface, he observed that Swordfish and the Hulk were gone, 
Blackened bodies were floating downstream beside him, and choking men clinging to bits of smoking wood. Fifty feet high, a swirling demon of green flame danced upon the river. It had a dozen hands, in each a whip, and whatever they touched burst into fire. As the current began to drag him towards the mouth of the river, Davos's sense of self-preservation kicked in, and we see him thinking about his old friend, Salador San, and the rear guard standing off in the bay, who might be able to pick up floating survivors. It was then he saw that the boom chain, whose presence had earlier niggled at the back of his mind, had been raised. Where the river broadened out into Blackwater Bay, the boom stretched taut, a bare two or three feet above the water. Already a dozen galleys had crashed into it, and the current was pushing others against them. Almost all were aflame, and the rest soon would be. Davos could make out the striped hulls of Salador San's ships beyond, but he knew he would never reach them. A wall of red-hot steel, blazing wood, and swirling green flame stretched before him. The mouth of the Blackwater Rush had turned into the mouth of hell. So, one of George's real-world influences for Tyrion's boom chain was the chain that was employed at Constantinople across the mouth of the Golden Horn to keep invaders off the city walls. It was used to great effect for centuries and was only breached a handful of times, including one notable instance in which it was defeated by Byzantines using Greek fire, which ironically is the major real-world influence for wildfire. Well, George R. R. Martin admittedly mixes and matches history to suit his own literary agenda, and in this case he took two elements of a single real-world event in which the boom chain was meant to repel invaders, but was defeated by a dastardly substance, whose nature was mysterious and powerful and highly revered by the Byzantines, and turned them into a typically Martinian horror. Here are George's comments on the tactic as he employed it. What Tyrion wanted to do was to lure in as much of Stannis' fleet as he could, and then raised the chain so they couldn't get back out when they unleashed the wildfire at them. Wildfire, of course, is my magical version of Greek fire, and as fantasy is bigger, so wildfire is Greek fire times ten. It's Greek fire, but it's worse than Greek fire, and it's got a little magical element to it. It's really nasty stuff, and it burns with green flames, which is a nice pyrotechnical effect. Okay, so Tyrion's plan is massively successful, in spite of the losses incurred by the royal fleet. Recall that Davos notices the absence of three of the key vessels of the fleet, meaning Tyrion didn't commit his entire navy, but Joffrey still complains about, quote, my ships, as he watched the Inferno. Tyrion notes that it could not be helped, our fleet was doomed in any case. But moving into Tyrion's point of view, it soon becomes obvious that even with the destruction of the bulk of Stannis' ships, things are still going badly for the defenders, and Stannis is not to be counted out yet. That's right. As Tyrion watches events unfold from atop the city walls, he's greeted with the scene of destruction, quote, a jade holocaust. But it's not complete destruction, and Tyrion knows it. Half a victory, he thinks, and it will not be enough. While the chaos made it difficult to fully follow what was happening beneath the city walls and on the river, Tyrion could see that some of Stannis' ships were getting away. A river's current was a tricky thing, and the wildfire was not spreading as evenly as he had hoped. The main channel was all aflame, but a good many of the mermen had made for the south bank and looked to escape unscathed, and at least eight ships had landed under the city walls. Landed or wrecked, but it comes to the same thing. They've put men ashore. 
Worse, a good part of the south wing of the enemy's first two battle lines had been well upstream of the Inferno when the hulks went up. Stannis would be left with 30 or 40 galleys, at a guess, more than enough to bring his whole host across once they had regained their courage. And knowing that his own men were not the sort to stand their ground if things started to go sour, he decided to take advantage of the feeling of victory many of the observers upon the wall were feeling to organize a sortie to the riverfront where he could observe enemy troops making their way towards the mudgate. He sends word to Jason Bywater about the enemy along the riverfront and allows Joffrey to take command of the whores so he could make good upon his promise to send the rebellious antlermen to Stannis. Yeah, typical Joffrey had had the naked prisoners trust and with antlers nailed to their heads and was looking forward to sending them to Stannis using the massive trebuchets now at his disposal. And no sooner had Joffrey moved off with Merin Trant and Osmond Kettleblack as his personal guard than a runner came with news that Stannis' men had landed upon the tourney grounds and were bringing up a ram to the king's gate. And so Tyrion rushes through the empty city streets to the king's gate, where he finds Sander Clegane in charge. But, having already led three sorties, the first of which we saw through Davos's point of view, and lost half his men, he's not inclined to go out again into the inferno that lay outside the gate. He refuses Tyrion's command to make ready to go out again, point blank, and tells him, Open the gates. When they rush inside, surround them and kill them. I'm not taking more into that fire. So the fire has utterly unnerved Sandor Clegane, and Tyrion realises with shock that the Hound is afraid, thinking, He is dead on his feet. The wound, the fire... He's done. I need to find someone else. But who? And finally, understanding that there is no one else, Tyrion decides to lead the sortie himself, hoping he can shame the recalcitrant knights under Clegane's command into following him. Clegane himself is finished, outright refusing to follow the Hand's orders and essentially deserting his command in that moment. And inside Mager's Holdfast, Cersei was still keeping court for the noble women of the city in the Queen's ballroom, and being updated by periodic reports from Osfrid and Osney Kettleblack. When she hears the news that Tyrion has gone to drive off the attackers at the King's Gate, leaving Joffrey at the trebuchets, which were quite close to the Mud Gate, now also coming under attack, Cersei gives the order to have Sir Osmond bring the King back to the castle. Yeah, and that order would have a serious, even mortal impact on the defenders at the gate. In the meantime, Tyrion has driven off the attackers at the King's Gate, and seeing fighting along the riverfront near the mud gate, Balon Swan's men, or Lancels, or both, decides to lead his party up from the tourney grounds to join in the defence of the mud gate from outside the walls. And Tyrion's description of the battle beneath the walls and his own first experience with battle fever is graphic and gory. As one knight and man-at-arms after another tries to kill him and he deals death repeatedly with his bloody axe, he thinks, I am half a man and drunk with slaughter. Let them kill me if they can. And outside the mud gate, he comes upon Balon Swan, who points to a number of men-at-arms surging onto the piers from the ships. Observing their path, he could see that, quote, 20 galleys were jammed together out there, maybe more, it was hard to count. Their oars were crossed, their hulls locked together, with grappling lines. They were impaled on each other's rams, tangled in webs of fallen rigging. One great hulk floated hull up between two smaller ships. Wrecks, but packed so closely that it was possible to leap from one deck to the other and so cross the Blackwater. 
Yeah, we made them a bloody bridge, is what Tyrion thinks, before telling Sir Balon, Those are brave men. Let's go kill them. And Tyrion leads the defenders onto the bridge of ships with the king's guard, Sir Balon, and Sir Mandon at his side. What follows is more bloody slaughter and confusion, but amongst it, one small detail allows us to sink the moment when things began to turn against the defenders inside and without the city walls. Yeah, as they fought and killed men aboard the bridge of ships, it says, A naked man fell from the sky and landed on the deck, body bursting like a melon dropped from a tower. His blood splattered through the slit of Tyrion's helm. So without a doubt, this must be one of the antler men hurled from inside the city, naked, by Joffrey. So we know at that moment, Joffrey was still manning the trebuchets there. But based upon the timing of the messages to and from Cersei, we can guess that only moments later, the king would be whisked away by the Kettleblacks to the safety of the Red Keep. And at the Mudgate, when they saw the king being taken away, the gold cloaks broke. Men began to throw down their arms and desert, killing the commanders who tried to rally them, likely including Lord Jason Bywater, who was killed by an unidentified arrow. On the bridge of ships, the wreck Tyrion was standing on starts to fall apart, and he sees himself in danger of being carried downstream to the wall of burning ships that still blocked the mouth of the river. As the deck he was clinging to spun around, he caught a glimpse of the action on the south bank, and, confused as he was by the change of orientation aboard the moving wreck, he is unable to make sense of what he sees. Yeah, it says, On one side of him was a raging battle, a great confusion of bright banners waving above a sea of struggling men, shield walls forming and breaking, mounted knights cutting through the press, Dust and mud and blood and smoke. So at first he thinks Stannis' army has completed the crossing. But once he realises this action is taking place on the opposite side of the river from the Red Keep, he wonders, if Stannis hasn't crossed, who is he fighting? Right, a hint to the careful reader that something new is going on on the south bank in the midst of the chaos of wildfire and siege weapons and dying men and horses that was playing out on both sides of the river and along the bridge of ships now. But Tyrion's attention is diverted by his own imminent danger in the appearance of Sir Mandon Moore, who, under the guise of holding out a hand to pull Tyrion to a more solid perch, instead slashed at the acting hand with his sword, slicing off Tyrion's nose in the process. While Tyrion's last-minute instinct kept that sword from taking off his head, just when it seemed Mandon would prevail after all, with his sword point held at Tyrion's throat, the quick-thinking Podrick Payne appeared from nowhere and shoved the heavily armoured knight overboard to drown down in the river. Tyrion was saved, but it would appear the battle was lost. When Sir Lancel Lannister told the Queen that the battle was lost, she turned her empty wine cup in her hands and said, Tell my brother, sir. Her voice was distant, as if the news were of no great interest to her. Your brother is likely dead. Sir Lancel's surcoat was soaked with the blood seeping out under his arm. When he had arrived in the hall, the sight of him had made some of the guests scream. He was on the bridge of boats when it broke apart, we think. Sir Mandon's likely gone as well, and no one can find the hound. The gold cloaks are throwing down their spears and running, hundreds of them. The whole Blackwater's awash with wrecks and fire and corpses. Okay, so Lancel Lannister tells Cersei the day is lost, and Osney Kettleblack takes up the tale. 
There's fighting on both sides of the river now. It may be that some of Stannis's lords are fighting each other. No one's sure. It's all confused over there. The hound's gone, no one knows where, and Sir Balon's fallen back inside the city. The riverside's theirs. They're ramming at the king's gate again, and Sir Lancel's right. Your men are deserting the walls and killing their own officers. There's mobs at the Iron Gate and the Gate of the Gods fighting to get out, and Flea Bottom's one great drunken riot. And Cersei doesn't seem to care about the impact of her orders regarding Joffrey, and once again orders him to be brought further inside to safety, from the castle gatehouse into Magor's. Further, she orders the drawbridge to the holdfast raised and the gate barred. Cersei departs the ballroom in a rage, slamming her hand into her cousin Lancel's wound and leaving him near senseless and bleeding on the floor. Sansa is left to take control in the Queen's ballroom, which she does to a point before retreating to her own chambers on the advice of Sir Dantos. And once there, Sansa would observe the scene on the river and beyond. The southern sky was a swell with glowing, shifting colours, the reflections of the great fires that burned below. Baleful green tides moved against the bellies of the clouds, and pools of orange light spread out across the heavens. The reds and yellows of common flame warred against the emeralds and jades of wildfire, each colour flaring and then fading birthing armies of short-lived shadows to die again an instant later. Green dawns gave way to orange dusks in half a heartbeat. The air itself smelled burnt, the way a soup kettle sometimes smelled if it was left on the fire too long, and all the soup boiled away. Embers drifted through the night air like swarms of fireflies. In the middle of her fearful musings about her fate and future, Sansa discovered an intruder in her chamber. The missing Sander Clegane had been drinking wine and sleeping in her bed. Drunker than I've ever seen him, she thinks, and his words to her indicate the depth of his fear, his rage, and his intentions. He no longer cares who is winning or losing the battle outside, only knowing that he has lost the battle inside himself. Cursing Tyrion, he tells her that he's leaving and asks her to come with him. When she doesn't answer, he takes the song she had once promised him with a knife to her throat and leaves, making for the Iron Gate and the road north. Now let's return to the curious detail of the fighting on the south bank that both Tyrion and Osney Kettleblack have now mentioned. While no one inside the city knows it yet, salvation had appeared from out of the west as dusk settled on the day of destruction. The fighting that Tyrion observed and Osney reported to Cersei would turn out to be the vanguard of the combined Lannister-Tyrell army, arrived to take Stannis in the rear at the last possible moment proving that war can truly be a game of inches, let's review that the defenders were abandoning the walls, the major unit commanders almost all dead or missing, and the king's gate under attack by a battering ram. Yeah, it surely appeared that the city was mere moments from falling to the attacking army in spite of Tyrion's naval victory and valiant defense of the walls and riverbank. But let's also review what had been happening with Lord Tywin Lannister. As we mentioned, Edmure Tully's defense of the Red Fork had held Tywin in the Riverlands long enough for news to reach him of the situation at King's Landing. After his army failed to take the crossing, he was able to retreat in good order to the southeast and meet up with Lords Rowan and Tarly at the headwaters of the Blackwater Rush. And from there, the combined force would march south to Tumblr's Falls, where they would find Lord Mace Tyrell with their own huge army and a fleet of barges to ferry men and horse swiftly downriver. So it would appear that Peter Baelish had been busy since he departed King's Landing many weeks ago. 
While curiously enough, no messages had been returned to Tyrion in all that time, there had been a huge movement of troops into the Riverlands. Yeah, now Mace Tyrell is known to have been at Highgarden with 10,000 men when Catelyn met with Renly at Bitterbridge, and presumably when Littlefinger travelled there to treat for Marjorie's hand. The bulk of his army had remained at Bitterbridge when Renly raced to Storm's End to deal with Stannis, taking only his cavalry, numbering nearly 20,000, and comprised mostly of Stormlords, who nearly all went over to Stannis upon Renly's death. So it was Renly's foot and the Reacher Lords who had remained at Bitterbridge, and it was these men, numbering upwards of 60,000, who were taken under control, killed or scattered, by Lord Randall Tarley following Renly's death. That the Reach would work quickly to secure their position on a winning team is no surprise. But it is perhaps a surprise to find their massive army so far north, well inside the borders of the Riverlands. That didn't happen by accident, and given Mace Tyrell's obvious opportunism, the uncertainty of Tywin Lannister's position, even up until a matter of days before he merged his army with Tyrell's, and the fact that Rob Stark appeared to be winning and was evidently an eligible young man, we're going to offer a tiny bit of speculation here. Yeah, we do wonder if perhaps Mace was playing his own wait-and-see game there in the southern Riverlands. We wonder what his course of action would have been if Tywin had defeated Edmure Tully and achieved that crossing at the Red Fork. Though victorious in that moment, that's the one event that could have led to a Lannister defeat, with Rob's army cutting off any move back east by positioning themselves athwart the Gold Road, and Tyrion and Cersei being left to Stannis at King's Landing. Could Mace have had in mind to position himself not only to make an alliance, but to make the most advantageous alliance he could in the moment? Could he have been considering joining with the Starks and Tullys had they gained the upper hand, as they so nearly did? Okay, so some speculation on our part, hinted at by Mace's convenient presence in the Riverlands, and perhaps by Littlefinger's curious silence to Tyrion and Cersei for those many weeks after he departed the capital. But as it happened, we'll never know. The Tyrells joined with the Lannisters, and by floating down the Blackwater Rush and disembarking a half a day's ride from the capital, arrived in the vicinity of King's Landing only as the day seemed lost for the defenders in the city. It was Lord Renly! Lord Renly in his green armour, with the fire shimmering off his golden antlers. Lord Renly with his tall spear in his hand. They say he killed Sir Guyard Morrigan himself in single combat, and a dozen other great knights as well. It was Renly, it was Renly, oh it was Renly. The banners, darling Sansa, oh to be a knight! So, arriving at King's Landing as dusk fell on the day of the battle, the combined Lannister-Tyrell force swept in from the west on two sides of the river. Lord Tywin led the right wing against the enemy that had crossed the river, while Randall Tarley and Mace Tyrell take the center and left, respectively. Interestingly, Tywin taking the right here is somewhat atypical for him, as he generally preferred to lead from the rear, commanding the reserves. We wonder if this is a singular instance of Tywin being motivated by emotion as his daughter and grandson were in grave danger inside the city. Yeah, and remember, the only other time we see Tywin ruffled is when he gets the news of Jamie's capture at Whispering Wood. Okay, and back to the attack on Stannis. While many had crossed the river, landing on the tourney grounds and riverfront and threatening the King's Gate and Mudgate, most of Stannis' men remained on the south bank. While Tywin took care of those who had crossed, the Reach forces on the south descended on the rest. Remembering that the bulk of Stannis' army were men who had served his brother Renly prior to his death, 
It's likely that not too long ago, most of these men had been compatriots in a different cause. That's right, and speaking of Renly, an ingenious suggestion by Peter Baelish led to Sir Garland Tyrell, the commander of the Tyrell Vanguard, to don Renly's distinctive green armor with its golden antlered helm. The vanguard sliced through Stannis's army, quote, like a lance through a pumpkin, every man of them howling like some demon in steel. Engaging with Stannis's vanguard, now led by Sir Guyard Morrigan, formerly Guyard the Green of Renly's Rainbow Guard, Renly himself killed Sir Guyard in single combat. Yeah, and remember that since the attackers came up from the rear, in order for vanguard to meet vanguard, Garland truly had to storm straight through the army from back to front. Imagine the confusion of the surprise attack and the fright of the men at seeing their deceased leader descend upon them like a vengeful spirit, taking his wrath straight to the one visible symbol of Renly's legacy, Sir Guyard, who had gone over to Stannis in spite of the brothers' obvious quarrel. And we discussed Renly's ghost in depth in our Renly episode, so we can leave it there to focus upon the outcome. Okay, and seeing things were turning sour, it was time for Salador San, banished to the rear guard by the now dead Imri Florent, to prove his use. Bringing his ships to shore, he began taking on as many men as he could, while Sir Roland Storm, bastard brother of Lord Bryce Caron, led an attack by the rear guard to cover the retreat. Stannis was able to make the ships along with 1,500 of his men, but the vast majority of his army would either be captured or killed, with many men killing their fellows in order to obtain a space on the Lysini rescue fleet. A blast of trumpets announced the entry of Lord Tywin Lannister. He rode his war horse down the length of the hall and dismounted before the Iron Throne. The Lord of Casterly Rock made such an impressive figure that it was a shock when his destrier dropped a load of dung right at the base of the throne. Joffrey had to step gingerly around it as he descended to embrace his grandfather and proclaim him Savior of the City. The aftermath of the battle is seen mostly through Sansa's eyes. She's in the throne room when Tywin is declared savior of the city and takes his place as Joffrey's hand. The spoils are doled out to the victors, with the Tyrells and their bannermen reaping many benefits, including Sir Garland Tyrell being rewarded with the Florence Brightwater Keep. Peter Baelish is richly rewarded as well, though Sansa doesn't comprehend what his role had been. Tyrion, having survived the battle but now confined to his sickbed, is ignored, though Lancel Lannister, who had been his subordinate, was rewarded with the lands and title of Darry in absentia, as he himself was recovering from a wound. Yet yeah, Tyrion would later think to himself, I thought I won the bloody battle. Is this what triumph tastes like? Nonetheless, it was a triumph for the Lannisters and their allies and the 600 new-made knights. Even most of the lords and knights who had fought for Stannis and been left behind in the field and captured bent the knee to Joffrey and were welcomed back into the king's peace and restored to their lands and titles. Only a handful did not, notably a bastard of House Florent, and another nameless knight who declared, Stannis is the true king, a monster sits the Iron Throne, an abomination born of incest. And this particular knight's accusations so enraged Joffrey that he lost his temper and sliced his arm open on the Iron Throne in his rage. The young king was led from the hall by a group of maesters sobbing to his mother who had rushed to his side. Though forewarned that she must show no emotion, Sansa could hardly control her delight at the public declaration that she would be set aside in favor of Joffrey marrying Marjorie Tyrell. Mace's dream of having his daughter queen would come true after all, however much he may have hedged his bets in the planning stages. 
And though Sansa couldn't know it, she had Peter Baelish to thank for it. Yeah, that's the hidden explanation for his lavish reward of Harrenhal and the title Lord Paramount of the Riverlands. And she would also have him to thank for something else that day, though she wouldn't know that either. That night in the Godswood, Sir Dontos Hollard would challenge her happiness, telling her, The Queen will never let you go, never! You are too valuable a hostage. And Joffrey, sweetling, he is still king. If he wants you in his bed, he will have you. Only now it will be bastards he plants in your womb, instead of true-born sons. And of course Sansa is suitably shocked, and Dantos consoles her by telling her that the day for her escape has been set, the night of Joffrey's wedding. He gives her a gift, quote, a hairnet of fine-spun silver, the strands so thin and delicate the net seemed to weigh no more than a breath of air. Dantos tells her it is lovelier than you know. It's magic, you see. It's justice you hold. It's vengeance for your father. It's home. Okay, so the stage is set for Sansa's flight and a highly significant event that we'll be taking up in our next episode. Before we move on from Blackwater, though, we want to offer a little summary we're calling the Blackwater What Ifs. For as a battle that ultimately swung on the thinnest of margins, there are countless points that beg the question, what if? Yeah, that's right. And typical George to give us such a complex web of events that changing some of the smallest of details could have led to a completely different outcome. Consider some of the following. In the realm of the obvious, we've all wondered what might have been if Edmure had not given battle to Tywin and Rob's plan to trap the Lannisters in the Westerlands had worked. But what if Edmure's battle had taken half a day longer and Tywin had arrived too late to save the city? And speaking of Tywin arriving, what if the Tyrells had not moved north to meet him, or if Randall Tarly had followed his wife's relations, the Florence, in going over to Stannis? What if Sandor and Joffrey had behaved differently during the battle, and what if Tyrion had balked at destroying so many of his own ships in what might be the worst example of friendly fire we've ever seen. And speaking of ships, what if Stannis' navy had arrived sooner? A simple matter of bad weather caused the delay, remember? What if the sun had been shining? And what if Stannis hadn't sent Melisandre away, remembering that she sees danger to herself? She might have seen wildfire and convinced Stannis of the danger. Or if Stannis had given the cautious Davos Seaworth command of the fleet, or at least a voice in its operation. And more on Stannis. What if he had moved his entire army across to the north bank at any time prior to Tywin's arrival? especially if he had been able to mount attacks on one or several other of the city gates. Remembering the dearth of defenders inside the city might have been easily overwhelmed by attacks at multiple points. And if Stannis had attacked and taken the southern tower and disabled the boom chain, his overwhelming naval advantage might have been preserved. And finally, if Stannis had trusted Salador San and allowed him to be placed higher in the ranks of ships rather than the rear guard, San might have perished in the inferno with so many others, leaving Stannis with no retreat from the field. Imagine a captive Stannis in the hands of Tywin and Cersei Lannister. These are just a handful of many factors, both large and small, that come into play as the story of the Battle of Blackwater plays out upon the page. And George purposefully gives us readers ample opportunity to see many of these pivotal moments so that we would feel that Stannis could win the day, that Cersei and Joffrey could be defeated. The verisimilitude he achieves by adding this tension to the story, by placing us inside the uncertainty of the narrative, is unparalleled. 
As in many real-world battles, the fate of King's Landing balances on a nice edge, and we see a host of possibilities unfolding before us just before the hammer blow is delivered by the arriving army from the west. Okay, so we've given the Battle of Blackwater a pretty thorough treatment, and now we're going to return to Rob Stark in the west. After taking Ashmark, Rob and his army moved on to the Crag, the seat of House Westerling, whose castellan was Sir Rolf Spicer, the brother of Lady Westerling. While Small John Umber and Black Walder Frey scaled the walls, Rob himself commanded the ram that shattered the gates. While the crag fell to the Stark forces, Rob took an arrow wound in the attack, and it fell to the daughter of the house to nurse him back to health. Yes, and it was during this time that Rob received word that Theon Greyjoy had murdered his brothers at Winterfell. He would later describe the sequence of events to his mother. I took an arrow in the arm just before Sir Rolf yielded us the castle. It seemed nothing at first, but it festered. Jane had me taken to her own bed, and she nursed me until the fever passed. And she was with me when the great John brought me the news of... of Winterfell... Bran and Rickon. That night, she... She comforted me, mother. And being the son of Ned Stark, Rob did the honourable thing and married the girl the next day. In so doing, he lost the phrase, and both Catelyn and Arya would see the fallout in their respective points of view, as Perwin and Martin Frey would quarrel with Edmure and leave Riverrun with their men, and Arya would witness ravens arriving at Harrenhal with the news. I am a creature of grief and dust and bitter longings. There is an empty place within me where my heart was once. Meanwhile, back at Riverrun, Catelyn had also received word of the situation at Winterfell. The news that her two youngest children had been murdered by the young man who had been Ned's ward must have been unbearable. And it's clear that her thoughts turned to the two children of hers who remain in captivity. And the interview she had with Sir Cleos Frey some weeks earlier. Lannister will exchange Arya and Sansa for his brother. Yes, he sat on the Iron Throne and swore it. Before witnesses? Before all the courts, my lady, and the gods as well. I said as much to Sir Edmure, but he told me it was not possible that his grace, Rob, would never consent. And, of course, that much was true, as we saw in one of Cat's earliest interactions with her newly crowned son at Riverrun. But Catelyn made the decision, after a midnight interview with Jamie Lannister, to take both Tyrion and Jamie himself at their words and return Jamie to King's Landing in the protective custody of Brienne of Tarth to effect the trade. Yeah, and the impacts of that decision cannot be understated. When it became known, Kat was confined to her chambers until Ed Muir's return from his engagement with Tywin Lannister. It was from this confinement that she saw the raven arrive from the crag with news of Rob. While Maester Vyman would not share the entire contents with her, on the following day after Ed Muir's return, she witnessed an apparent argument and the departure of a number of men. Men who fought with Edmure on the fords. Sir Perwin Frey, who had travelled with her to Bitterbridge and Storm's End and back. And his bastard half-brother, Martin Rivers. Close to forty men poured out through the castle's gates. To what end? She did not know. While Edmure still doesn't see fit to inform her of the details, when she receives him, she notes... He was thin and drawn, with pale cheeks, unkempt beard, and two bright eyes. 
The news he does share of Stannis' defeat at King's Landing and the new alliance between the Lannisters, the Reach, and Dorne seems serious enough. In his distress, he informs her that he has sent messages to Roose Bolton at Harrenhal. He's determined to regain the very important bargaining chip of Jaime Lannister and tells Roose only that the Kingslayer had escaped and must be recaptured and returned. Yeah, and all Cat's hopes seem to evaporate with that news. Brienne might have gotten him to King's Landing safely, so long as no one was hunting for them, she says. But now, what she doesn't know is just how bad things have become, since without the critical explanation for the departure of the phrase, she can hardly comprehend the horror that must be engulfing Edmure in that moment. While he's characterised as rash and somewhat inexperienced, he is no fool. He'd know by now, without a shadow of a doubt, how the timing of his victory over Tywin allowed Tywin to retreat to King's Landing in good order and thus defeat Stannis. And he'll know that Rob has lost the phrase, which, combined with the news from the North and the Iron Islands, must have made it seem the walls were closing in on the Stark Tully cause. The loss of their key hostage was a deeper blow than Cat could have ever imagined. And at that moment, her brother Edmure was the only person who knew the full extent of their position. So meanwhile, over at Harren Hall, Aya would witness the arrival of these bits of news. First came the message about Bran and Rickon's deaths, which arrived at a moment when a group of Freys were questioning Rob's cause and their dedication to it. Again, we have cause to wonder at Walder Frey's intentions before Rob's marriage became common knowledge, and then Roos sends a message to Helben Tullhart, ordering him and Robert Glover to put their captives at the newly recaptured Castle Darry to the sword, burn the castle, and take the command to Duskendale, there to take their vengeance. Yeah, that's a third of Rob's foot sent off on a mission falsely stated to have been ordered by Rob himself, critically, before news of Rob's marriage arrived, because it's only later that same day that the raven bearing news of Rob's marriage to Jane Westerling, and undoubtedly also Jamie Lannister's escape, arrived at Harrenhal. Arya hears the phrase arguing and sees little Elmar Frey, ironically and unbeknownst to her, her own betrothed, crying over his lost princess. Having been informed of Lord Bolton's intentions of leaving Harrenhal under the command of Vargo Hoat, Arya makes her escape with Gendry and Hot Pie that very night. Okay, and since Roose's treachery was becoming apparent, it's no doubt a good thing she left when she did. And speaking of Bolton treachery, let's return to Winterfell, where Theon had been having an uneasy time of things, experiencing the defiance of the small folk and the refusal of his sister to aid him. In his desperation, he accepted the offer of the Bolton serving man, known as Reek, to take a bag of coin and come back with a hundred or maybe two hundred men for him. And Theon was this desperate because he knew that Roderick Cassell, having just defeated Dagmar Clefjaw at Torren Square, was marching back to Winterfell with an army now strengthened by Kerwins, Tallhearts, men from White Harbor, Flints, Karstarks, and even some men from the Hornwood, all in all, numbering around 2,000 men. And on the morning that the Northern Army drew up at the gates of Winterfell, Theon seemed lost to all hope. He did. But even as Maester Lewin convinced him to surrender and take the black, a new army appeared from the south. Hundreds of them, quote, Northmen, with a bloody man on their banner. These men, at first, made to join Sir Roderick's force, but then fell upon them from behind and slaughtered their fellow Northmen. With a loss of only a few dozen 
what turned out to be the Bolton garrison under the command of Ramsay Snow annihilated Sir Roderick's force, killing the old Castellan, Leobald Tallhart and Clay Kerwin in the process. And so Theon opened the gates and welcomed Ramsay in as a friend. Ramsay claimed to have brought a force of 600 men, and while Theon thinks he had been outnumbered 5 to 1, that may have been a slight overestimation. In any case, there's no denying it was a slaughter of a much larger force by a smaller one using the worst treachery. As Ramsay would say to Theon, he thought us friends, a common mistake. And moments later, Theon would be served the same treatment as his handful of ironborn and all the men remaining in the castle of the Winterfell household were slaughtered in turn. And that's the last we hear of Theon for some time, except for a brief mention by Roos Bolton some weeks later, when he would lay the blame for the sack of Winterfell at Theon's feet, giving his own bastard son, once thought dead, the laurels for capturing Greyjoy and bringing the women and children of the household safely back to the Dreadfort. Bolton treachery should be obvious to the reader at this point, as the garrison of the Dreadfort could hardly have been employed by Ramsay without his father's knowledge, even before or shortly after. That's right, and as evidence that Roos knew full well what Ramsay was up to, and once again, possibly even before he had any news of Rob's marriage, we have Ramsay's final words in Theon's point of view as Winterfell burned. Save me the phrase and burn the rest. Burn it, burn it all. It seems unlikely that someone like Ramsay would want to save two little boys unless he had been specifically instructed to do so by his father. Add to that the timeline here, as the burning of Winterfell seems to take place very near to Arya's time as Roos's page at Harrenhal. Yeah, and given that it takes weeks for news of the outcome of the Battle of Blackwater to reach the small folk of the Riverlands, it seems even more unlikely that Roos could have commanded Ramsay's attack so quickly if his defection came only after Rob's marriage. In fact, we think there's a mounting case to be made that Roos planned his defection well in advance of Rob's marriage or Jamie's release, and that his decision was based upon a combination of his own ambition and his view of other tactical errors made by the Stark Tully army, as pointed out by the phrase in that meeting I witnessed at Harrenhal. Okay, and we're going to leave it there for this episode. When we return, we'll travel from the gates of Winterfell and the mind of Roose Bolton to the capital and the mind of Tywin Lannister, who's settling in to rule as his grandson's hand and writing many letters. We'll catch up with Davos and Stannis, with Balon and the Ironborn, Rob and Cat, Joffrey and Cersei, Jamie and Tyrion, and all of our other players, both major and minor. There'll be a pair of weddings, a number of journeys, and a few small skirmishes, but most of the pitched battles have played out. In that regard, the Battle of Blackwater was really the climax of the War of the Five Kings. Speaking of which, we're going to lead out today with some food for thought on the subject from a maester of the Citadel. Archmaester Benedict insisted that there had never been a War of the Five Kings, since Renly Baratheon had been slain before Balon Greyjoy had crowned himself. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed this second installment of our War of the Five Kings series. We'll be back soon with part two of our Myths and Legends series, and look for us to be wrapping up the War of the Five Kings in the new year. And now, as usual, it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks, as always, to George R. R. Martin for giving us so much to analyze in A Song of Ice and Fire, and to Kevin MacLeod for allowing us to use his music in our production. 
And as usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Valyrian Steel and Castle Steel levels. Consider being a patron of the podcast, and you could be hearing your name here too. Heartfelt thanks to Mark Joseph, a.k.a. The Snow in Winterfell, Alexis, Amber, Cinder of the Citadel, Chris K., Marja the Mage, Jessica, Joe, June, Kurt, Mary H. of House Stark, Painkiller Jane, Rusted Revolver, John H., Lady of the Frostfangs, William James, Sir Bobby the Knight, Thrower of the Valyrian Steel Chair, Maltude, Melitza, Yorlen, Lady Steelwind, Sharon of Littlefield, J.M., Demetrios, Matt, the Mad Maester of Castle Black, Oxheart, Eliana Targaryen, Casey, Boss, Arrowdo, Sir Kobe of House Stonesmith, Words or Wind, Deeds or Stone, Joy, Josh, Whitney, Marcel, Matthew, Aaron, Sasha, Aileen, and Lady Diarliz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. And thanks as well to Jim McGeehan of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire, Trish, Lorraine, Melinda, Faye, Sebastian, Jen, AJ, Arion, Princess Zandico of the Summer Isles, Chris V, Direwolf, Greg, Brendan B. Fish of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire, John of House Dane, Liz, Marilyn, Rebea, Lady of the Waves, Steve, The Working Dead, Zainab, James, Sir Kyle Dane, Wielder of Sundown, Axe of the Afternoon, Matt M, Jeff Gnarly the Long Snapper, Septus Mashley, Rebecca, Jean, Megan, George, Yvonne, Mama J, Mother to Cripples, Bastards, and Broken Ones, Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Green Shield, Sakari Sand, Black Eyed Lily, Manon, Rachel, Felix, Brian, Matt L, Michael, James M, Rachel Mary, Jose, Michael M, Jason, Tanner, Iden, Jennifer, Quincy, Amber, Dimitri, Scott Greenseer, Ellie Pat, and Sir Ryan Goodwin, Knight of the Queen's Guard. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use, or if you feel we've left anything out. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate via PayPal, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, and of course, you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Google+, or Tumblr. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon with more Myths and Legends. Bye for now.